Hi everyone, I'm here in North Carolina doing a virtual field trip all about clay foraging and how to process that clay. So we're here at the site uh, where we do have a good deposit of clay. Um, and I thought we could take a virtual walk and we can kind of talk about some of the things that have led to the formation of that clay, as well as how to find it, collect it, and process it. So uh, yeah, let's begin the walk and we'll, we'll go over sort of what this is all about. So we're here in the forest near the clay and we're in uh, we're in the Smoky Mountains right outside of a national park. Um, one thing to know is that you always have to know your source of where you're going to collect the clay. So um, you cannot collect anything in a national park or a state park. In national forests, you can collect small samples. Uh, and I've got that information from the Forest Service's website. You can't be collecting artifacts or anything like that, but you can take small mineral samples um, of things that tend to be everywhere. So um, as we kind of navigate through this landscape, I, uh, I remember this quote that Keith Simpson told me, which is, um, all you need to make a beautiful piece of pottery is a mountain and a few million years. And that's going to provide us with everything we need uh, to make a beautiful piece of ceramic art. So I guess, what does Keith mean by that? <laughs> I guess what he means is that everything that we need is here in the mountains. We just need time to transform the materials that are there into clay. And that happens through the chemical weathering of rock. So as we kind of head down towards the water, um, you can actually see that the soil is, is red. We're starting to see some hints of, of a clay deposit here. We've got that nice rich red color, uh, but you can see there's all this other stuff mixed in with it. Um, so in the mountains here, there's just rivers and water and rocks everywhere. Um, and it makes for, uh, it makes for some really good clay in North Carolina. This state is known for its clay really, and it has a huge, rich history in ceramics going all the way back to Native Americans all the way through the pots that were made during slavery um, to the pottery that's made here now there is a, a ton of potters here everywhere you go in Asheville there's a pot shop basically uh, so I just wanted to show you kind of these rocks that are around and um, how they've been weathered by the water and then we'll also take a look at some mica deposits as well. So there are three main types of rocks and everything is gonna fall into one of these main categories. The first is igneous rock. And that is basically when molten earth or magma comes up to the surface, uh, almost like in a volcano or at the top of a mountain and it comes to the surface and it cools very quickly. Uh, and how fast that cools is going to depend on what materials are made, basically. So the igneous rock is magma that has come to the surface very quickly. I'm actually just gonna pause the video here before we get into the mica. The igneous rock comes to the surface and cools very quickly. Um, the next type of rock is metamorphic rock, which could be made from other types of rock that become under high amounts of pressure. So it's pressure and heat and time that transforms them. So igneous is, is a relatively quick formation when we talk about the cooling of magma. And then metamorphic is a very long process. Um, metamorphic rock is also known to have kind of strains or ribbons through it, like that one rock we just walked over, uh, such as marble. Marble would count as one of those. Um, igneous rock, again, cools very quickly. And then the next type of rock is sedimentary rock, 
which is kind of a, um, it's an amalgamation of all sorts of things. And um, the thing about all this is it doesn't just describe one type of rock or one, um, one specific type of mineral. It's really a variety of minerals that get formed in this way. So uh, sedimentary rocks are formed from particles of sand, shells, pebbles, and other fragments of material. And together, all these particles are called sediments. So gradually, the sediment accumulates in layers over a long amount of time. Uh, and then eventually it all becomes sort of one thing. So sedimentary rock, you're only going to find fossils in sedimentary rock really because uh, that's the only process that would catch the fossils and not destroy it because we're talking about, normally we're talking about uh, magma flowing over a surface of the earth and drying really or cooling really fast or the metamorphic rock being under intense heat and pressure. So fossils wouldn't be down there necessarily and if they were by any chance they would be destroyed. Um, same with the igneous rock. So sedimentary rock is also types of clay are found in that family. Um, these are our limestones and shales, among other things. When I went to graduate school in Alfred University, we uh, there's shale all over the landscape. And it's basically, you can see it along the river bank stacked up uh, in sort of these layers. And it looks hard, it looks like a rock, but you can grab it and you can kind of crumble it really. And, and it's almost like a clay-like, substance right there and then normally close to the shale you can find a good clay deposit. Um, but really what we need to make clay is a source of alumina and silica because that's the main components of clay is alumina, silica, and water. So I just wanted to show you here we have uh, some mica too. Uh, look at that really nice beautiful flake. This is all over the landscape here. This is a source of silica, but we're not gonna use it like that in our clay. Uh, it will be mixed in with the clay as almost, um, not really an aggregate, but it's in the clay. So when we fire it, we can see it kind of sparkling all over. Some people like to add mica to their clay uh, and it's what they call a micaceous clay. What's, what's interesting about mica is it's highly refractory. And back in the day, it was actually used in furnaces as a furnace window. So if you would find like a giant sheet of mica, they would use that as the window of a furnace because maybe glass wasn't invented or if there was glass, it wasn't refractory enough. But this stuff is highly refractory. Uh, really cool stuff. So again, I'm just gonna kind of keep talking as we go kind of around in the landscape and we take a look at this stuff. I'm trying to give you a very visceral experience of the landscape as far as the walk and the materials that we kind of go over and things like that. Um, a lot of the things that we need to make pottery are what you'd call feldspars or feldspathic rock. And that's where we get a lot of the alumina and silica that will break down over time into clay, but we can also use feldspars feldspar as straight as they are, uh, it, it, as glaze materials, uh, as for sodium, for calcium, for potassium, all these things. So when you look at the chemical makeup of clays and glazes, we're not looking necessarily for an exact specific feldspar or an exact specific silica, although sometimes we are, but we're looking for a source of these things in any way we can get it, whether that's potassium, sodium, uh, all those things really. We're looking for a source. So what's interesting is feldspars are not specific to just the earth. Uh, we found them on the moon. We found them on the Mars, which is really interesting. Um, so feldspars crystallize from magma as veins in both intrusive and extrusive igneous rocks and are also present in metamorphous rocks. So as I was saying before, we're looking for the chemical weathering of these rocks. So intrusive is uh, pockets of magma that stay below the surface and takes thousands of years to cool, where extrusive magma has flowed to the surface of the earth 
as a basically as a volcano and it can cool within seconds or months. So we're here at the clay deposit. Uh, this is what we would call secondary clay. So think of it as there is an initial deposit of clay. That's called the primary clay. And then often that primary clay is moved by water, either rain or rivers, to a secondary location. And that location, uh, that secondary location is often picking up all sorts of other materials along the way. So secondary clay might have a little bit more impurities to it. So here you can see the clay is kind of sandy. It's short. It doesn't stick together very easily uh, because it's not just straight clay. See, I'm squeezing it here. It does stick together, but very low plasticity. So we have to process it. Um, the actual percentage of clay to sand that is in this batch is not, there's not that much clay. Like uh, it's in there, but it's a very short clay body. So we also talk about, you know, clay in terms of plasticity and shortness. If it's plastic, it can, uh, bend without cracking very easily. It has the ability to stretch without cracking where a short clay body is often a little bit crumbly. Um, if you're at Greenwich House, you might think of the T1 clay as a little bit more short maybe than the white stoneware throwing clay. I think of that as a, a lot more of a plastic clay body. Um, what's interesting is that this chemical weathering of the rocks over time, it creates such a, a fine particle. And that's really what we're looking for, for it to be defined as clay and what separates it from other materials. So first of all, uh, it has to be a combination of alumina and silica for it to be qualified as clay, but it also has to be a particle size under two micrometers. So we're talking about a very, very tiny particle of clay really and it's this tiny tiny particle one of the finest particles in mineral science that allows it to stick together through this process called cohesion basically and that's what where we get plasticity from um, and basically rules of cohesion just say that um, tiny tiny particles can attract one another as opposed to the larger particles they might repel and fall apart the, the clay is so tiny, um, once water gets involved in them, they stick together, uh, they bind up, and it gives us what we know to be clay, really. So we've got the clay collected, we've got it in our bucket, I've taken it home, and the next video will be all about the processing of that clay and how we get it to a little bit more workable of a state. So thanks for joining.